Module 2, Building Background Knowledge. What are Animal Defense Mechanisms? Unit 1, Lesson 4. Guiding Questions. How do animals' bodies and behaviors help them survive? How can a writer use knowledge from their research to inform and entertain? How do animals' bodies and behaviors help them survive? How can a writer use knowledge from their research to inform and entertain? I can paraphrase information presented in a read aloud on animal defense mechanisms. I can determine the main idea of sections of award-winning survival skills. I can identify details that support the main idea of sections of award-winning survival skills. First up, We'll be doing a read aloud and paraphrasing using our book, Venom. Find this page in your purple workbook. It says Source, Venom, pages 26 through 27 at the top. Pause the video now until you've located that page in your workbook. You will listen as I read pages 26 and 27 out loud. On the first read, you are only listening for the gist. Don't sit on the grass. Grass, it's our favorite natural carpet. We plant it as lawns and meadows for homes, parks, and other areas. It plants itself to create prairies, savannas, and other grasslands. We're not the only beings who like grass. Some turf lovers are critters we just as soon not meet. A field day for ants. What's a picnic without sandwiches, chips, lemonade, and venom? Who's bringing the toxins? Ants, of course. Ants are members of the same order as bees and wasps. But while some bees and wasps are solitary, ants, on the other hand, are always social. Their nests are found underground, in trees, and in buildings. Some species live in large, well-ordered colonies that may number in the millions. Colonies may even join together to form super colonies, covering a wide area of land. Female workers are wingless. Males and young queens have wings, and among many colonies during mating season, they fly out to establish new nests and colonies. Then the wings drop off or are pulled off. Ants are found in grasslands, as well as deserts, temperate woodlands, and rainforests. Most of them are harmless, such as the little black ants that invade our picnics and our houses for food. But some species use their rear ends to sting or spray, and nobody wants to picnic around them. Ants that sting. In America, the nastiest of all these stingers may well be imported fire ants. Fire ants arrived in the U.S. by hitching rides on ships from South America. They build big mound nests, two feet wide and up to three feet high in fields and lawns. They are especially fond of golf courses. Worker ants exit from tunnels that can extend as much as 10 yards from the mound. They are omnivorous and will use their venom to paralyze or kill many kinds of small, ground-nesting animals for food. They also aggressively defend their nests. When an enemy threatens, a fire ant will clamp on with its jaws and spin in a circle, stinging over and over with its rear end. A single fire ant's stings cause itchy, burning blisters, but they're not usually deadly. However, when one ant stings, its alarm pheromone alerts the other ants, which come rushing out of the ground. No animal wants to face a whole colony of 200,000 stinging ants. After reading this text for the first time, we want to think, what is the gist? Ask yourself, who or what is the text about, and what do we learn about it? After reading this section of Venom, I can say that the text was about ants. And what we learn about is that while most ants don't cause any problems, there are some ants that sting, specifically the fire ants. And so for the gist, we're going to write down some ants can sting 
for protection. Now I will do the second read. Listen for information about how ants protect themselves. Then in the second column, we will record how these things help them survive. Don't sit on the grass. Grass, it's our favorite natural carpet. We plant it as lawns and meadows for homes, parks, and other areas. It plants itself to create prairies, savannas, and other grasslands. We're not the only beings who like grass. Some turf lovers are critters we just as soon not meet. A field day for ants. What's a picnic without sandwiches, chips, lemonade, and venom? Who's bringing the toxins? Ants, of course. Ants are members of the same order as bees and wasps. But while some bees and wasps are solitary, ants, on the other hand, are always social. Their nests are found underground, in trees, and in buildings. Some species live in large, well-ordered colonies that may number in the millions. Colonies may even join together to form super colonies, covering a wide area of land. Female workers are wingless. Males and young queens have wings, and among many colonies during mating season, they fly out to establish new nests and colonies. Then the wings drop off or are pulled off. Ants are found in grasslands, as well as deserts, temperate woodlands, and rainforests. Most of them are harmless, such as the little black ants that invade our picnics and our houses for food. But some species use their rear ends to sting or spray, and nobody wants to picnic around them. Ants that sting. In America, the nastiest of all these stingers may well be imported fire ants. Fire ants arrived in the U.S. by hitching rides on ships from South America. They build big mound nests, two feet wide and up to three feet high in fields and lawns. They are especially fond of golf courses. Worker ants exit from tunnels that can extend as much as 10 yards from the mound. They are omnivorous and will use their venom to paralyze or kill many kinds of small, ground-nesting animals for food. They also aggressively defend their nests. When an enemy threatens, a fire ant will clamp on with its jaws and spin in a circle, stinging over and over with its rear end. A single fire ant's stings cause itchy, burning blisters, but they're not usually deadly. However, when one ant stings, its alarm pheromone alerts the other ants, which come rushing out of the ground. No animal wants to face a whole colony of 200,000 stinging ants. After hearing this section of the text read again, what notes can we take and in which box of our note catcher should we put them? Because this book focuses on animal defense mechanisms, we're going to focus on the fire ant, the ant that actually stings. And so I'm going to look at information there to help me figure out how do ants protect themselves. I see that it says some species use their rear ends to sting or spray. That's going to be important. That's an important way they protect themselves. I'm going to add that to the left-hand column and examples of how ants protect themselves. Then I remember reading that fire ants use venom to actually kill animals for food. That is another way that they help protect themselves with their venom. So I'm going to include that in my chart. Another thing that the fire ant does is to sting with their rear ends when they're threatened by an enemy. So that's one way, another way that they protect themselves by stinging. Now thinking about these three facts that we've recorded, um, the examples of how ants protect themselves, I want to think about how this helps them survive. Well, the fire ants, their stings cause itchy burning blisters and that would help them because it would make their predators run away and then they would probably learn their lesson and not bother the fire ants again. And finally, below these two boxes, you can write down other facts about ants that you found were interesting but maybe weren't examples of how they protect themselves. Things like ants are social, female worker ants are wingless, 
and males and young queens have wings. These are facts that I didn't know before I read this information, but I found very interesting. And so I'm going to include them in the other facts about ants. Now I want you to take a few minutes and write down what you think this section of venom was about. You can use my sentence starters to help you. You can fill in the blank using information from the chart up above. Explain what this section of venom was about. Fire ants use blank and blank to protect themselves. Their stings blank. Go ahead and fill in that information from the chart. You can pause the video now if you need more time to complete this work in your purple workbook. Now we're switching gears and we're looking back at the article you started reading yesterday, Award-Winning Survival Skills. We'll be rereading sections of this text and we will be trying to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words. How to find the main idea. First, you must read the text, find the gist or the main idea, and then you write it down. You go back to the text, read it again, this time looking for supporting details, and then you go back to the main idea and you revise it. You might need to change the main idea slightly so that it fits all of the details that you have included. Best Action Hero, the Spiny Pufferfish. Ordinarily, the meek, spiny pufferfish drifts slowly in its native coral reef habitats around the world. Its round body and small fins make it a sluggish swimmer and perfect prey. But just try to eat it and get ready to be blown away. When threatened, the puffer inflates to three times its normal size. It just swallows it water until its stomach is completely full, says biologist and pufferfish expert Ralph Turnigan at the Florida Institute of Technology. How does the fish change shape? Its skin and stomach are super stretchable. Also, it lacks a rib cage, no bones to impede an expanding stomach. Dare to swallow an uninflated puffer? Sharks have actually died from a pufferfish inflating in their esophagus, says Turnigan. Other predators who've witnessed Superman in action stay clear of the big puffer. Now that you've read through the text, you want to write down the gist or the main idea. Remember when finding the gist or the main idea, we're asking who or what is the text about and what do we learn about it? So I know the text is about pufferfish, and I see that what we learn about it is that it can blow up when it's threatened. So that's what I'm going to write down for my main idea or my gist statement. Now that we've written down the gist statement or what we think might be the main idea, we're going to go back to the text and we're going to find some details that help support what we think is the main idea. In the text it says the puffer can inflate to three times its normal size. I see that the puffer fish swallows water until its stomach is completely full. Then I see it's able to do that because its skin and stomach are super stretchable and it lacks a rib cage. So those are two more details I'm going to underline and put in my chart. And finally, sharks have actually died from a puffer fish inflating in their esophagus. I'm going to add that detail in as well. I'm going to underline it and add it to my chart. Now that I've found all these details, I want to look back at the main idea. All I've written is that the puffer fish blows up when threatened. I feel like with all the details I've found, I actually need to revise that main idea to be a little bit, um, a little bit more. And so I'm going to take off the part where it says blows up when threatened and I'm going to change that to inflates. I think that's a better science word to use. I'm going to say the pufferfish inflates to defend itself against predators. And that, that gives the, if somebody were hearing my main idea, they would know that a little bit more information about the pufferfish before they actually read it. And I think the, the de it now supports those details a little bit better. Pause the video to complete this in the article and in your purple workbook.
How to find the main idea. First, you must read the text, find the gist or the main idea, and then you write it down. You go back to the text, read it again, this time looking for supporting details, and then you go back to the main idea and you revise it. You might need to change the main idea slightly so that it fits all of the details that you have included. Best special effect, the three-banded armadillo. Note to Hollywood special effects creators. If you need to devise ingenious strategies for heroes to protect themselves against bloodthirsty attackers, take inspiration from the three banded armadillos. While all armadillos sport leathery armored shells to end, fend off prey like ravenous wildcats, three banded armadillos are the only ones that curl themselves into completely enclosed balls, says Southwest Missouri State University biology professor Lynn Robbins. The three banded armadillo and southern three-banded armadillo live in South America. Their body shields consist of bony plates and a layer of horn or keratin, fibrous proteins that make up tissues such as hair and nails. The plates themselves are formed by ossified or hardened skin. On their shells, three hinged bands give them the flexibility to roll themselves up. Since the shoulder and haunch plates aren't attached on the sides to the armadillo's skin, there's plenty of room inside to fit a head, legs, and tail. The shells are also good insulators. They trap heat to keep the creature active in winter. When threatened, armadillos curl up and leave only a tiny peephole from which to peer out at their predator. If touched, they snap totally shut. However, some fierce jaguars have been known to use their savage teeth and claws to crack open a tasty armadillo. Even the most dazzling special effects have their limits. Now that you've read through the text, you want to write down the gist or the main idea. Remember when finding the gist or the main idea, we're asking who or what is the text about and what do we learn about it? So the text is about the three-banded armadillo. And what we learn about the three-banded armadillo is that it can roll up into a ball. So that's what I'm going to write down for my main idea or my gist statement to start off with. Now that we've written down the gist statement or what we think might be the main idea, we're going to go back to the text and we're going to find some details that help support what we think is the main idea. As I reread through this first paragraph, I see that it tells me armadillos sport leathery armored shells to fend off prey. So I'm going to underline that and then I'm going to add that supporting detail to my chart. Pause the video to complete this in the article and in your purple workbook. Now that we've underlined the supporting details in the text and written them in our chart, we're going to go back to the main idea and see if it needs to be revised or changed at all to support all the details that we found. So I'm going to continue looking for details that support this idea that the three-banded armadillo rolls up into a ball. And as I'm reading the second paragraph, it tells me that their body shields consist of bony plates and a layer of horn. Now that seems important because if it does roll up into a ball, you know, what protects it when it's in that ball? Well, it must be the bony plates that... Um, are on their body. So I'm going to underline that and add that to my chart. I'm going to continue reading and I see in the next sentence it says on their shells three hinged bands give them the flexibility to roll themselves up. That definitely supports our main idea that we have so far that it rolls up into a ball. This sort of tells us more about how it's able to roll up because it's very flexible. So I'm going to underline that and I'm going to add that to my chart. I'm going to continue reading 
Since the shoulder and haunch plates aren't attached on the sides of the armadillo skin, there's plenty of room inside to fit a head, legs, and tail. Well, that tells me a little bit more about how it's actually protected inside there. So if all of its um, parts can fit inside that, that ball, that tells me more about how it protects itself. So I'm going to underline the part that says plenty of room inside to fit a head, t legs, and tail. I'm going to go ahead and continue reading on in the last paragraph. When threatened, they curl up and leave only a tiny peephole from which to peer out at the predator. And if touched, they snap totally shut. Okay, so again, that's telling me more about how they roll up and that they can either peek out or they can snap totally shut if they really need to protect themselves. So I'm going to underline that part as well and add that to my chart. Now that I've recorded all of those details, I want to go back to my main idea. And before I had written, the three-banded armadillo rolls up into a ball. I think I can do a little bit better. I think I can revise that main idea um, to include some more important vocabulary words as well as give a little bit more information. So I'm going to say that the three-banded armadillo curls itself up into a complete ball to protect itself from predators. So that's what I'm going to add I'm going to revise it and I'm going to add that to my main idea to make it just a little bit better. How to find the main idea. First you must read the text, find the gist or the main idea and then you write it down. You go back to the text, read it again, this time looking for supporting details and then you go back to the main idea and you revise it. You might need to change the main idea slightly so that it fits all of the details that you have included. Best Impersonator The Mimic Octopus Do you know an undiscovered superstar? A natural talent who can mimic others on demand? For years, divers in murky waters off Indonesia snapped photos of an octopus, an eight-armed invertebrate, which means it has no backbone, that seemed to impersonate a cast of marine animals through mimicry or looking like another species. When a group of scientists got hold of the images, they hightailed it to Indonesia last year to identify the extraordinary 60 centimeter or 24 inch long copycat, which they dubbed the mimic octopus. Many animals mimic other creatures to turn off predators. The harmless milk snake, for example, resembles the poisonous coral snake with its bright red, yellow, and black bands. But this octopus is the only animal we've found so far that can mimic more than one animal, says biologist Tom Tregenza at the University of Leeds. The octopus can ape at least three critters the flatfish, the lionfish, and a sea snake, Tregenza's team claims. To mimic the flatfish, the lumpy octopus speeds up, yanks in all eight arms, alters shape and color, and ripples its body in a wave. Why imitate a slew of creatures? One clue, while many octopuses live and hide in reefs or rocks, the mimic octopus slinks along sea floor mud in plain sight. There's nowhere to hide, Tregenza says. Besides, adds team scientist Roger Hanlon, an octopus is a soft, juicy hunk of protein that everything else out there wants to eat. Flatfish are far more populous and less likely to attract attention. How does the superstar perform its tricks? It features a flexible body that twists into multiple forms and skin cells called chromatophores, which contain various colored pigments. Muscles around each chromatophore constrict or expand the cell. When constricted, skin color lightens. When expanded, color darkens. The octopus alters color patterns by constricting and expanding thousands of chromatophores at the same time. Next stop, Warner Brothers. 
Now that you've read through the text, you want to write down the gist or the main idea. Remember when finding the gist or the main idea, we're asking who or what is the text about and what do we learn about it? The text is about the mimic octopus and what we learn is that it can change what it looks like. So let's write down that write that down for our first main idea or our gist statement. We can you'll come back to it later to revise it. I want you to listen as I reread the text. As I reread it, I want you to be underlining details that you think are important, important supporting details. When I finish reading it, I'll underline what I think was important and you can check your work with mine. Once you've checked your work, you can add those details into your chart on your own in your purple workbook. So again, you're going to listen to the text as I reread it. Then you're going to underline, as I read, things that you think are important. At the end of me rereading, my, word, my sentences will pop up. I'll underline what I think was important, and you can check that with the work that you've done. Then, based on what I've underlined, I want you to put that into your chart in your purple workbook. Best Impersonator, the Mimic Octopus. Do you know an undiscovered superstar? A natural talent who can mimic others on demand? For years, divers in murky waters off Indonesia snapped photos of an octopus, an eight-armed invertebrate, which means it has no backbone, that seemed to impersonate a cast of marine animals through mimicry or looking like another species. When a group of scientists got hold of the images, they hightailed it to Indonesia last year to identify the extraordinary 60 centimeter or 24 inch long copycat, which they dubbed the mimic octopus. Many animals mimic other creatures to turn off predators. The harmless milk snake, for example, resembles the poisonous coral snake with its bright red, yellow, and black bands. But this octopus is the only animal we've found so far that can mimic more than one animal, says biologist Tom Tregenza at the University of Leeds. The octopus can ape at least three critters, the flatfish, the lionfish, and a sea snake, Tregenza's team claims. To mimic the flatfish, the lumpy octopus speeds up, yanks in all eight arms, alters shape and color, and ripples its body in a wave. Why imitate a slew of creatures? One clue. While many octopuses live and hide in reefs or rocks, the mimic octopus slinks along seafloor mud in plain sight. There's nowhere to hide, Tregenza says. Besides, adds team scientist Roger Hamlin, an octopus is a soft, juicy hunk of protein that everything else out there wants to eat. Flatfish are far more populous and less likely to attract attention. How does the superstar perform its tricks? It features a flexible body that twists into multiple forms and skin cells called chromatophores, which contain various colored pigments. Muscles around each chromatophore constrict or expand the cell. When constricted, skin color lightens. When expanded, color darkens. The octopus alters color patterns by constricting and expanding thousands of chromatophores at the same time. Next stop, Warner Brothers? So again, now that I've reread the text, you should have information underlined in the text. Now I will reveal to you the sentences that I think you should have underlined. You're going to compare them to what you've already done and then take what I've underlined and put that into your chart. Pause the video now in order to take the time to write these details into your purple workbook in the chart. 
Now that we've underlined the supporting details in the text and written them in our chart, we're going to go back to the main idea and see if it needs to be revised or changed at all to support all the details that we found. Now that we've read through this article, you can go back to the third column and you can put in some details from the text that support the inferences you made in earlier lessons. So you should have the first two columns filled out and now you're filling out the third column using details from the text to support your inferences. End of lesson four.